Let me ask you a question. What are you like in a conversation? Well, in our house, conversations between me and my husband, Gordon, can go either one of two ways. If I'm relaying a story, then it's a running joke that I can take at least 10 minutes with irrelevant parts along the way, like, oh, and I saw this girl and she was wearing this really gorgeous jumper. And I thought, I wonder where she got that from. Anyway, I've Googled it and I think I've found it. At this point, I've lost him and he's like, Louise, what's your point? Well, when he's talking, I've already decided what the end of his sentence is going to be anyway. So I say it and he's like, no, I was actually going to say this. It's only when he says my point is and I'm like, aha, I hear you now. Now I'm sure that none of you can identify with me. But in today's passage, we're going to see exactly this point that despite the significance of what Peter, James and John are going to witness, that Peter still misses a point. And so God has to speak to him very directly for Peter to fully appreciate who Jesus is. So grab your Bibles and let's read together Mark 9 verses 2 to 7. I'm reading from the message version. Six days later, three of them did see it. Jesus took Peter, James and John and led them up a high mountain. His appearance changed from the inside out, right before their eyes. His clothes shimmered, glistening white, whiter than any bleach could make them. Elijah, along with Moses, came into view in deep conversation with Jesus. Peter interrupted, Rabbi, this is a great moment. Let's build three memorials, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He blurted this out without thinking, stunned as they all were by what they were seeing. Just then, a light radiant cloud enveloped them and from deep in the cloud, a voice. This is my son, marked by my love. Listen to him. Can you imagine being Peter, James or John, seeing this transfiguration of Jesus where he literally changed from the inside out? Let's look at verse 2. It says, his appearance changed from the inside out right before their eyes. His clothes shimmered, glistening white, whiter than any bleach could make them. I mean, this is one of those moments when you see something that is so bright, you know, when you look at something that's so bright, you almost can't look at it. It's so dazzling, you have to shield your eyes. That's what the transfiguration was. And these three apostles were getting a glimpse who, who Jesus really was as the glory of the Lord fell on him. But this transfiguration moment also included Moses and Elijah, two of the greatest heroes of Israel. These two incredible figures of faith also appeared and talked with Jesus. Moses, he represented the law and Elijah represented the prophets. Let's think about that briefly. Because Jesus said, didn't he, that he came to fulfill the law, that he was giving a purpose statement for his ministry. We read in Matthew 5, verse 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And we know that Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets through his death and resurrection. And it's here in this moment of transfiguration that he's doing that thing that three, these three apostles witnessed the whole thing in front of their very eyes. And at this point in the transfiguration, God was declaring and affirming Jesus' role in the salvation story. Because you see, when he became transfigured, he became the image of the risen Jesus who conquered the power of sin and death. What absolute mind-blowing scenes it must have been for the apostles to have witnessed. But let's take a look at their reaction, Peter's particularly. The three of them had just witnessed an event unlike anything they had seen before or would ever see again. Jesus had just been transfigured before their very eyes, but in this holy moment, Peter interrupts a heavenly conversation and decides to blurt out an awkward and inappropriate response. 
by telling Jesus, well, it's a good thing the three of them are there with him. More than that, he suggests he can make three tents, one for each of them, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, I actually think that Peter thought he was doing the right thing here. As Jewish people made tents to symbolise God's provision, and they would be looking forward to the coming kingdom. But the big mistake that Peter makes is in making Jesus equal to Moses and Elijah and therefore failing to see him for who he is. I think many of us are drawn to Peter in some ways as we can identify with him because sometimes he's the best of the disciples, other times he's really not and he falls short. Sometimes he has faith to walk on water as Jesus did, but then he sees the wind and the waves, becomes terrified and begins to sink. In an Anthony's talk last week, we heard that Peter acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah. Yet here he is, once again, missing the actualization of who the Messiah really is. I found this monologue, which gives us an insight into what it was like from Peter's perspective. And suddenly I realized I wasn't dreaming, that this was real. I felt like somehow I'd slipped into another world and I was terrified, typically for me. I started gabbling, blurting out anything that came into my head, trying to make the situation seem normal. Some nonsense about building shelters for them, James told me afterwards. Then it got scarier. We were caught up in the cloud, James, John and I. My heart was pounding so hard in my chest, I thought I was going to burst and I was quaking all over. If I was going to die, to be struck down because I was unworthy to be in the presence of God himself, I wanted it to happen quickly and painlessly. Instead, we heard a voice. It seemed all around us, loud and booming, yet it also spoke quietly as a whisper into our ears. This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. I fell at Jesus' feet. And when I got up, the cloud had gone and we were alone with him. I love this insight into Peter. I think it captures the guy that he was, eager and excitable and brash, but not always thinking ahead. You see, Peter was quite an impulsive character and he absolutely would, would have wanted to honour Jesus, Moses and Elijah. But yet it took the voice of God to still him and for him to see that Jesus is the only one who matters. That bright cloud surrounded them, and from deep within the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, marked by my love. Listen to him. But why is it that God gave the command to listen to him? Why is that so significant for us to know? You see, physically they could hear, but spiritually, they'd forgotten to switch their ears on. They'd become more concerned with what they wanted to hear, what the world could offer them. They wanted to listen to and hear the things that they wanted to hear. And we can understand that, can't we? Because we can pay more attention to what social media is telling us, to what the news is telling us we should know, to what politicians believe is true, to what celebrities are saying, we have people visiting psychics and mediums looking for truth, searching for something to cling to. And even we ourselves can become more focused on what one another has to say, rather than listening to Jesus and hearing what he has to say. And when we fail to do that, the most important voice, the voice of Jesus gets lost amongst those voices that are way less important than his. His voice is the voice that will ultimately give us a fullness of life. So when God said to them, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. He was also saying, if you listen to him, then you'll listen to me. Because to listen to Jesus is to listen to God. Listening is a heart issue. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. 
You see, we're happy, aren't we, when we read scriptures and promises like Jesus made in the book of Matthew when he says, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We love that. We like the reassurance. We like what that means. But yet we're not too sure when he tells us to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow him. I mean, that's a big ask, isn't it? But yet to be a true disciple of Jesus means that even when we listen to the words that make us want to avoid them, like those, that we still obey and we still do what he says. When Jesus says that we must take up our cross and follow him, it means that each and every day we need to choose to deny ourselves. And denying ourselves means that we choose to not do our own thing. We choose to not indulge in ourselves. We choose to put aside any selfish desires. We are choosing to put aside anything that's going to get in the way of our relationship with him and therefore how we work for him. But that can be hard, can't it, when life is busy and full and we have other voices coming into our heads. But at the same time, Jesus is asking us to take up our cross daily. He's asking us to remember his sacrifice on the cross for us. He's asking that it becomes part of our everyday life. But why does he say this? Because otherwise we'll fall short again and again. We'll forget who he really is. We'll forget the significance of who he is and who he is in our lives and what he can do for us, just like Peter did. And we'll begin to follow ourselves instead of him. And to be honest, in my experience, that never fails to fail. When I become all about me, about my plans, my wants, my desires, they aren't always in line with Jesus' plans for me and therefore his plans for you, for a life-giving, fulfilling life in him. Because he's asking us to follow him right to the end. And that means that therefore we get to share him with others. He wants us to lead others to him as we become true disciples of Jesus Christ. In the words that God spoke to Peter, listen to him. He's telling us that we have to, whether we like it or not, because there's treasure and gold found in listening to him. It's our spiritual ears that need to be switched on so that we don't miss who he is or what he has for us. The transfiguration of Jesus was such a significant moment for Peter. In fact, he recalls it in 2 Peter 1. He says this, We are not retelling some masterfully crafted legend when we informed you of the power and appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we saw his magnificence and splendour unveiled before our very eyes. Yes, Father God lavished upon him radiant glory and honour, when his distinct voice spoke out of the realm of majestic glory, endorsing him with these words, this is my cherished son, marked by my love. All my delight is found in him. And we ourselves heard that voice resound from the heavens while we were with him on the holy mountain. In that moment of transfiguration, we know that Moses and Elijah were there. Isn't it pretty amazing that Elijah didn't die, but he was lifted up to heaven? However, he'd actually handed a lot over at that point to Elisha because he'd become tired and he basically had enough. And then there's Moses. He didn't quite get to enter the promised land in the end because of pride and anger, which always seems a little bit unfair. Yet, where is he now? He's on top of a mountain in the promised land. And how did he get there? He got there because of Jesus. These two incredible heroes of the faith got to get to God because of Jesus. And if they got to get to God because of Jesus, how much more do we need him? I wonder what your response is to this today. Ask yourself, 
Do I listen to Jesus' voice? Or am I more concerned in hearing other voices? And how much time, therefore, do I spend doing this than listening to God himself? But you know what the most exciting part of this is? It's that you can get to have your own transfiguration experience today. That means that you get to recognise Jesus for who he is, the king above all kings, the one who is above all. And when you do that and you say yes to him, then you get to transfigure your own lives to mirror that of Jesus. He says that we are called to first love God with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our minds and with all our strength. And secondly, that we get to love our neighbour as ourselves. That is the greatest commandment of all. You see, maybe Peter wanted to stay on the top of the mountain forever. And why wouldn't he? It was a glorious moment. And we would probably have chosen to do the same. Yet we're called to come down from the mountaintop, to be Jesus' hands and feet on this earth, to be disciples who make disciples. So how do we now fulfill the whole of the Old Testament? The whole of the Old Testament of the law and the prophets. We do it by seeing who Jesus is and we choose to listen to him. I love this ending in one of my little boy's Bibles. It says this, for anyone who says yes to Jesus, for anyone who believes what Jesus said, for anyone who will just reach out to take it, then God will give them this wonderful gift. To be born into a whole new life, to be who they really are, who God always wants them to be, their own true selves, God's dear child. Because you see, the most wonderful thing about this story is, it's your story too. <laughs>